it's good to be back. It's good to get away. And la- I've always taken a week off. And then last summer we took two weeks. And I thought, man, that two weeks was really good for me. And so I took another two weeks this year. And it's really good because I miss being in the pulpit. So if you ever wonder, why does he take two consecutive weeks? It, it really makes me miss it. And it, it really encourages me uh, to be back in it. So it's, uh, it's a good thing. Ever, it's a win-win. She was the most beautiful girl I had ever laid eyes on still is today but a friend of mine had said to me way back when he said man do not date a church of christ girl that's what he said which didn't intimidate me and it really didn't didn't scare me it really intrigued me and and i i was very curious about this and so i began to ask questions and, and christy really played the situation very well as she never put pressure on me never never pushed uh, if, if I had a question or if I was interested, she'd say, just come check it out. Go with me, whatever you think. And so I did and for about three months and then eventually um, studied with the preacher and was baptized into Christ back in 1993. Everybody has a story. Where you were born, where you were raised, uh, what your parents did, how you grew up. Everybody has a story and in the same way, every Christian has a story. A conversion story. And that's what we're going to look at over the course of, well, probably the next month or so. Uh, We're going to look at the conversion stories from the book of Acts. You know on Wednesday nights, uh, Corey has set up a a fantastic uh, summer series. And we're talking about the sermons in Acts, all of our guest speakers that are coming in. So we thought this would be a perfect time to talk about the conversion stories in the book of Acts. So turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and what I want you to do is we go through these next several weeks. I think the, if all go, works out well, we'll wrap this series up the last Sunday in August. So it's going to be a lengthy series, but there are a lot of conversion stories in the book of Acts. All right, But I want you to think about what do these conversion stories have in common? What's the common denominator? Here's the thing, folks, when people come and will ask questions about baptism or salvation or, or whatever it be, uh, many times I'll say to them, just study Acts. Read Acts. And you're not going to see, let me just give you this, this little nugget of wisdom. You're not going to see this individual's conver- converted differently than this individual. Or or this story played out differently. There's going to be a common denominator in all of the stories with the different individuals. So let's start in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 9 through 11. It says, There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. Verse 11, And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. So the first thing I want us to focus on is Simon's background. This guy is known as Simon the Magician or Simon the Sorcerer. He had these abilities to perform these magic arts, whatever he was doing. But he had apparently impressed a lot of people. He had become very well known and people would would congregate to him, flock to him if you will, just to see what he was going to do next or, or if they could figure out how he was doing this magic trick if you will. He had developed quite a following from the people of Samaria. All uh, They paid attention to Simon from the least to the greatest. Simon had even been compared to... It almost put on a status, if you will, uh, uh, like God. I mean, if he can do these things, then certainly he's, a, he's like a God. And that's how, they, that's how they viewed this Simon, the sorcerer. But here's the thing. Fame is very intoxicating and has a tendency to go to one's head and lead to arrogance. One of the things I like to do on vacation is grab a book or two and, and read it. And one of the books I, I bought prior to vacation this year... I won't tell you who it's about because it's not about trashing the the guy. But famous, famous celebrity. And I thought, man, i got to read this book. And I I read it. But i got to tell you, fame fame was really his downfall. 
It was incredible. He became so famous so fast, and it, and it was so intoxicating to him that someone would come and, sh- and put their hand out to shake his hand and introduce, and he would walk right by them without uttering a word, without acknowledging their existence. Nowhere in any realm is that okay. All right, you get that, right? That's just not okay. doesn't matter who you are. Fame is intoxicating. And this is kind of the fame Simon was dealing with in Samaria. These people knew who he was. They knew what he was about. They wanted to come and see what he was going to do next. And he liked the fame. He liked being known for his magic. And even so highly regarded, if you will. We're not told this, but I have to wonder, was Simon, was he using this magic to make a little money on the side? You know, I wonder, I wonder, very good possibility. His background was all about the magic for a long time, and it had, it had made him famous, as I said. So here's the question as we move on. How do you convert, how do you convert a well-known, famous magician who's very well thought of? Let's move on, continue on with me. Let's look, look at Simon's conversion, verses 12 and following. But when they believe Philip... I'll tell you who Philip is in a minute. As he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Remember, all these people of Samaria are gathered around. They're used to gathering around Simon. Now they're hearing Philip preach. Both men and women are baptized. Even Simon, the sorcerer himself, believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed. He was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen. That is a key. You need to underline that in your Bible. It's okay to to write in your Bible. You need to underline fallen. Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. That is a key phrase, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. But the very last lesson in our series, the last Sunday of August, is going to be about the Holy Spirit in Acts, and I'm really going to focus on this part. So I'd underline that. It's okay to write in it. Had not fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. So Simon's conversion, all was good for Simon... And his magic until Philip showed up preaching the good news. Now, if you look back, I think it's Acts, it is Acts 6, but I think it's about verse 5, and I'm not going to read all of it. Acts 5, you've got some widows being overlooked in the daily distribution. Not Acts 5, Acts 6, I apologize. Uh, we're being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And so the apostles, so that they can continue preaching the word and continue doing what they're doing on a daily basis, they said, you guys choose some men, basically choose some servants full of the Spirit, okay? And so Philip is chosen in verse 5. And then in verse 6 it says, along with some other guys, these are men uh, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Decaner, Tim, so many others. But then verse 6 says, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So Philip, that's about to show up in Acts chapter 8 and start preaching in Samaria, had received the laying on of the apostles' hands. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today. My focus is on Simon's conversion. We'll talk about the laying on the apostles' hands in weeks ahead, okay? But I'm just trying to set the tone for you. So in Acts chapter 8, what happens is, remember in Acts 7, Stephen is stoned. You remember that? Everybody says, yep, we remember. And then in Acts chapter 8, Saul is persecuting the church like crazy, so it causes this dispersion. So Philip ends up in Samaria where he's preaching the word and he's performing miracles. And people are seeing the miracles and they're doing what? They're coming together going, I want to hear what he's got to say. Which is exactly what they were doing with Simon the sorcerer. Simon had nothing to say. All he's doing is doing this magic. But Philip had something with his, 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 he had something with his miracles, a message for them. So that's kind of a little background on Philip and takes us to where we are in Acts chapter 8. So all's good with Simon. Uh, Philip shows up preaching the good news. The good news is the gospel. Let me show you real quick in 1 Corinthians 15. I always think we need to read this. This is another passage you've got to know. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're saved. This, this is a soul-saving message, the gospel is. If you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance that... Uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the message that Philip shows up in Samaria preaching. Now he's doing some miracles, and as he does miracles and he's healing people or casting out demons, whatever the case is, people are coming to him. He, he kind of gains a following. And with that, he's preaching the, the gospel to them. So my point is there, there's, there's, there's substance there where there wasn't with Simon's magic, okay? Are you with me? When the gospel is preached, people are baptized. In verse 12, Acts 8. But when they believe Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of, of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So they're not used to this. They're, they're used to seeing the magic, but that's it. That's all. That's, all. that's the show, folks. But see, Philip comes in, and he's, he's performing miracles, and they're gathering, thinking, well, who's this guy? What's this about? And then he's preaching to them a gospel, soul-saving message about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And oh, by the way, he died for you. And they're responding and being baptized. If the church... Is it growing? It's because the church isn't preaching the gospel. You say, what? Look in Acts 2. Look in Acts 2. When the gospel message is preached, people are baptized. Verse 36 and following. Let all the, this is Peter winding down his gospel sermon on Pentecost. And he says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made them him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they're cut to the heart. They've heard the gospel. Romans 1, 16 says the gospel is the power of God for salvation. What? Power of God. It cuts people to the heart. They hear about this, this Jesus who died on the cross for them personally. And they're going, you got my attention now. That begs for me to do something. And what do they do? Now when they heard this, they're cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What can we do? We put him on the cross. Our actions, our lives, our sinfulness put him on the cross. What can we do? I mean, are we just, just hell bound on roller skates? Do we have any hope? Is there any way out? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And, many, and with many other words, he bore witness and he continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Listen, so those who received his word, they believed it were baptized, and there added that day about 3,000 souls. When people hear the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation, they are baptized. They respond and are baptized. So we go back to Acts 8, our story on Simon. And Philip shows up performing miracles, preaching the good news of the gospel, and it says both men and women were baptized. Look at verse 13. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. So even this guy whose life has been all about performing magic, he hears this, he sees the miracles, but he hears this gospel message, and he responds and is baptized. But it's interesting that he follows Philip. Watch. And seeing, even Simon himself believed, verse 13, and after being baptized, continued with Philip, seeing the signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Who was amazed? Simon was amazed. 
Philip was the one performing the miracles. Simon was amazed because this is his forte. This is what Simon has done. He's a magician and now he's got this guy performing miracles and preaching this powerful message. People are following lines, following in saying, I want to be baptized. And, and even, even Simon is persuaded to be baptized. And he follows Philip. He has Simon's attention. He was amazed. He was interested in the miracles because that's who he was. That's what his life revolved around, if you will. That's what made Simon who he was. And look at 14 and following. So when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Let me take a time out. When the men and women and Simon, the sorcerer, were baptized into Christ, they received the indwelling gift seal of the Holy Spirit that we just read about in Acts chapter 2 when Peter said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling seal. It says, I belong to God. All right, are everybody with me? Thank you. I'm, somebody, somebody's with me. It's right where I want you to be, Carl. Okay. So, they come, verse uh, 16, for he, the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them. I told you you need to underline that part, that's key. Had not yet fallen on any of them. They had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the seal. But when the Spirit falls on someone, I'll spend a lot of time on this, miraculous activity occurs. When the apostles lay their hands on someone, they have those spiritual miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's how those miraculous gifts were passed on by the laying on the apostles. And you say, well, Philip was there. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Then they laid their hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit, verse 17. So Peter and John, who were not in Samaria, had to come down to Samaria after Philip preaches. And many are baptized. Even Simon the magician is baptized. they got to come down, Peter and John do, to lay hands on them to give them their miraculous gifts. Now, listen, 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 listen. Philip was there. We saw two chapters earlier where Philip had received the laying on of the apostles' hands. He could do the miracles, obviously. Look back in Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 4 and following. This was the dispersion when, when Saul was just wreaking havoc on the church. It says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down the city of Samaria, Samaria proclaimed to them the Christ, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, listen, for unclean spirits crying out a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed for, uh, or lame, excuse me, were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So Philip had those miraculous abilities of the Spirit, okay? Because the apostles laid hands on him in Acts 6. Now listen. Listen, listen, listen. Why does Peter and John have to come down there? Why can't Philip just lay hands on the people in the church and pass those gifts on to them? Because, listen, this is key. Those miraculous gifts could only be passed on by the laying on the apostles' hands. So when the apostles laid hands on Philip, which we saw that they did, Philip could not in turn lay his hands on someone and pass the gifts on. So... Peter and John absolutely had to come down there and lay hands on those new Christians or they weren't going to receive those, those abilities, those gifts. Everybody follow me? That's why Peter and John have to go down there. That's why Philip couldn't do it. So what does that mean? This is, this is extra. We've got, we got to hurry. This is extra. But what does that really mean to us? That means that when the apostles died, so did those gifts. Hello? When the apostles died, the gifts died. Because we don't have any apostles today laying hands on anybody. And they could lay hands on 500 people, but those 500 people couldn't lay hands on anyone and pass the gifts on. So when the apostles died, the gifts died. Are you with me? Okay. That, that makes so much sense. That follows perfectly with Scripture. I want you to get that. We'll talk more about it at the end of August. But what I want you to see is that Simon was converted the same way you and I were with the gospel message. All right. 
Let's move on. Look at Acts 8, 18 through 24. So we talked a little bit about his background, talked a little bit about his conversion. I want you to remember his conversion. He was baptized into Christ. That's going to be a common denominator, okay? I want you to remember that. Thirdly, let's look at Simon's struggle. I have it cracked into the water, so I'm going to. Okay. 18 and following. It said, now when Simon saw that the Spirit, listen, we just talked about this, was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. This dude was clueless. Weren't you as a young Christian? Because I was. I remember sitting in the pews, leaning over to Christy, going, now, what are we doing? And why? Do I pick it up and just take a bite of it? Or do I? You know, I'm asking all kinds of questions. And so this guy, he sees that the Spirit is passed on by the laying on the hands. He sees what Peter and John do, do and he's thinking, man, this is all right. I'm into the magic. If, if, if they would just lay their hands on me, then I would have these abilities, and I could lay hands on other people, and they would have that ability. He didn't get it. He, he didn't understand. He didn't have a clue. He, he understood how, the, how it was passed or how the gifts were passed on, but he thought he could do it as well. He wanted the miraculous abilities, but only the apostles could pass that on. All right, so he offers to pay for it even. Notice what Peter says. Verse 20, Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you. you and that may not, that's not how we talk today really. But that's pretty strong language. The money you're offering to pay for God's gift, may it perish with you. With you. Talk about death. Okay? That's pretty strong language. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Are you kidding? I added that, but I'm sure that's kind of what Peter was wanting to say. He says, you have neither part nor, nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent. Therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the blood, a bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He wanted, the, he wanted those gifts, he wanted those abilities. Magic had been his life. He was totally enamored with Philip. And that's why when he was baptized, it doesn't say all the other men and women followed Philip, but boy, Simon did. I've seen what he can do. I remember the magic I did. He, he had Simon. But then Simon sees how the gifts are passed on by the apostles' hands. He wants that, and he wants that ability. And Peter puts him in his place. Simon was a baptized Christian when he made that impure request. This is where it gets practical for you and me. Because Christians are saved believers, but baptized into Christ. But we're not perfect. We are perfect only one way, and that's through the blood of Christ. That's it. We still have impure thoughts. We still have impure motives. We still do impure things. And this is proof. You say, well, he was a young Christian. I understand that. I understand he was a young Christian. And young Christians struggle. But i got to tell you what, old Christians struggle too. Because they still live in this world. And they still struggle with the flesh. And we're going to struggle with this battle with the flesh as long as we're in this life. Galatians 5 talks a lot about that, the battle between the, the spirit and the flesh. How real it is. But this shows us, Simon's impure request shows us that Christians str still struggle with sin. Christians still struggle with sin. That's hard to say, Carl. Christians can be greedy. Christians can be self-centered. Christians can do things they shouldn't do. Once you're baptized, it doesn't mean your struggle is over. In fact, let me say this, your, bapti 
your baptism may even heighten your struggle with the flesh. Because, boy, Satan's going to key in on you. Man, he's going to work on you. I remember one guy asked a question in Bible class many years ago. Uh, and and I, I, I didn't. I was a little shocked by the question. Never had this question before. Because to me, it, there was an obvious answer. But he was sincere. He didn't, he didn't know. And he said, when we're baptized, when a person is baptized, do they still struggle with temptations? And I, I paused for a minute thinking, okay, where's the, where's the punchline? And there wasn't one. He was sincere. And I said, absolutely. Maybe even more so. We have God on our side to help us. We have the spirit that indwells us that I believe, that's another lesson, helps us. But we have an enemy that's going to do everything he can to rip us out of the arms of God. And he can't rip us out of the arms of God, but he can lure us away. And he does that well when we're not focused where we need to be. And when we read about Simon, his good heart, his, his response, yes, I want to be baptized, and he is, and he follows Philip, and he's learning about how the gifts are passed on, and how, what, how Philip's doing this, and he w- makes this, this request, can I have that? I'll hear, I'll pay you for it. Not understanding what he's doing, not understanding what he's asking, but showing us as Christians full well that we still struggle with sin. We still make mistakes. I'm not giving you a license. I'm not saying it's okay, but I'm telling you it's a reality. Now we want to learn from the mistakes. We want to learn from the struggles and hopefully make those weaknesses our strengths. Because I I tend to believe that Simon learned a lot from Peter's words. Peter's rebuke and then Peter's message. You need to repent and pray. And, And Simon's words back to Peter is, you pray for me. To the Lord. I don't want this to happen. So I really believe he learned a powerful lesson there. What I want you to see this morning. I want us to learn from Simon's story. How one comes to Christ. We're going to see it over and over and over again. And you're not going to look at this and go. You know what I remember Simon was baptized. But when the eunuch came to Christ. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't baptized. You're going to see that throughout the conversion stories. The common denominator, every one of them are baptized into Christ. And then we see how one lives for Christ as a result. This morning, we're going to wrap it up right there. We'll continue talking about our our conversion stories next week, I believe, with the eunuch. That's the next one we come to. So today, if you're struggling... If you need prayers, if you need encouragement, love from this family, maybe you need to respond and be baptized. We can do that. We're ready and prepared for that. We will have a shepherd waiting for you. If you have a need, a physical need or a spiritual need, we'd ask you to come. As together we stand and as we sing.